way back. I only ministered to people under the guidance of the Holy Spirit on soul and body level. I battled to accept unconditionally this new thing called spirit level ministry. Inner healing merely on soul and body level leaves the human spirit feeling more and more desolate, confused and ultimately forsaken. I was taught that your spirit is completely sorted out at the point of rebirth. And once you are reborn in Jesus Christ, it means that Jesus' throne is in the core of your human spirit and Jesus reigns there. But since we started with the spirit level ministry under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we notice there's greater freedom. People experience it as that they have an encounter with Jesus himself. I have the privilege of the before and the after. You know what? This is not about my glory or the Buddha's glory or ignited in Christ's glory. I do it solely and completely for the honor of Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's quickly look at the content of this teaching just to give you a feel of what you can expect. Firstly, we are going to look at the interconnectedness of human spirit, soul and body. And then the nature of the human heart, heart or spirit. Often we read in the Bible about a heart, of people's hearts. Your heart is your most inner human being part of you. And that is your spirit. The human spirit also needs healing and deliverance. Who is the healer or deliverer on human spirit level? The benefits of healing and deliverance from human spirit level. And then also the chains need to be broken on human spirit level. That is all about breaking bloodline curses as well as blood covenants that were made with the enemy on human spirit, soul and body level. Because many of us don't realize our ancestors don't only go back to our grandfather and grandmother or great grandfather and great grandmother. Our ancestors go back to the Garden of Eden. So how many thousands of years are that? What could have happened? In all those years and what we what we experience in beautiful believers in Jesus Christ is that there may have been Illuminati, there may have been paganism, there may have been witchcraft, there may have been active sun god worship, moon goddess worship, where your ancestors actually made covenants with the enemy and that is a very serious thing because our God is a righteous God and if there's a covenant in place you're not going to be able to break free from that. That covenant first must be broken. What is the process of inner healing from human spirit level? First, we need to look at the healing of hurt, shock and trauma, the hurt inner children and adults. So that's where we start. Many people ask us, believers in Jesus Christ ask us, but where do we start? We don't know where to start. And the answer is so easy and simple. Start with the inner healing. Hurt inner adults and hurt inner children. And you can minister to other people as well. It's not, as Jay says, rocket science. You can start by praying from human spirit level down to address the hurt inner children and the hurt inner adults. All of us have been hurt in our childhood. It's just the levels and the extent that vary. So everybody has got hurt inner adults or hurt inner children, and then hurt inner adults, people that went through a divorce, people that um, got hurt as adults, uh, maybe they got fired at their workplace, maybe... Accidents, death. Accidents, death, uh, losing someone dear to them um, that died. And that trauma must be dealt with from human spirit level down. That's where we start. And then demonically programmed DID on human spirit level due to sh hurt, shock and trauma. The Lord showed us that there's various levels of DID. And you get the SRA type of DID, but then you also get the demonically programmed DID. We'll get to the difference later. Then, and this is more advanced levels, you don't necessarily have to deal with that. Maybe you need to go to someone for help for the SRA type of DID, but there's also satanic ritual abuse type of DID on human spirit level due to hurt, shock and trauma. And then there's something that the Lord uh, revealed to us through His Holy Spirit quite recently and we admit we don't really fully understand that yet. But the Lord showed us that the enemy is able to take captive parts of our human spirit, a pot, a shattered pot, 
If I take a glass and I let it fall on the floor, what is going to happen? Shattering. Am I able to pick up a piece and it is separate from the glass, the big part of the glass that is now sh uh, shattered? It's, it's broken off. And your spirit man is spirit. It's not flesh. So the enemy, if the enemy has the right to do it, he doesn't always have the right to do it. But if there's serious witchcraft and covenants in the bloodlines, if maybe the person went through something like rape or sodomization and it was coupled with witchcraft, or, then the enemy may have the right to take a broken piece and to hold it captive in the spiritual realm. And that explains to us why many people that we've ministered to so far, perhaps people that were the victims of satanic ritual abuse, when they were small, uh, raped as a baby, maybe, sodomized, whatever. You know, it's terrible things to be talking about, but these things happen with beautiful believers in Jesus Christ. They struggle to get freedom. Yes, they make progress, but it's as if they feel, but something is still missing. I, I just don't get that full healing. It's because a part of the human spirits are being held captive by the enemy in the spiritual realm. And I admit we don't have all the answers there yet, but we know that it exists. It can definitely be done. We found it already in a couple of sessions with people. Then the, the deliverance from the strong men on human spirit level. There's a whole process that we follow there. You can see it there. We will go into depth there later on. It's cancelling their demonically programmed spiritual microchips, setting their captives free. That is um, the one teaching of ours. That's, it's a demonic soul copies level three. Dealing with demonic spirit copies. Because the Lord showed us that if the, the enemy can make a demonic soul copy of a, of a soul, and he can make a demonic soul copy through witchcraft, he can do exactly the same with the human spirit because the human spirit is also not completely unblemished. He cannot do it with the core, which is under Jesus' control. But it's possible, and even before people got reborn, it's possible to make spirit copies, demonic spirit copies. Addressing demonically programmed DID, asking Jesus to take the strong men away, and Jesus closes the portals. The spoiling of the houses of the strong men on soul and body level. Jesus says in his word, we'll, we'll get into that um, in more depth, that if we have bound the strong men, we can spoil their houses. So once the strong men are out of the way or are bound, we can, bind, we can simply bind the power demons and foot soldiers. Then we deal with the demonic soul copies. We cast the demons out. We lock the portals and we ask for infilling of the Holy Spirit. On soul and body level, it becomes like a mopping up process just mopping up. So, so much easier. There's no longer that struggle on human soul and body level that we had in the past. And then lastly, we will deal with questions and answers. So if you have any questions that, that comes up during the teaching, uh, let us deal with that at the end. So it is important to start with the interconnectedness of spirit, soul and body. And for many of you in the body of Christ, this is perhaps old news already. The warriors that are sitting here in front of us today and that are the audience, you know this by heart already, but maybe there's people outside there that listens to this teaching and watches it that doesn't realize, but we are triune. <clears throat> Our human being is triune. We are not only soul and body or spirit and body. We are spirit, spirit, soul and body. Now, our spirit man is just as it says, it's spirit. So it's not flesh, it's spirit. And our spirit man comes from God. It is difficult for us to comprehend that, but your spirit has always lived with God. How we don't know, that is the, that is the mysteries of God, that we, we don't need to know that. But our spirit came from God. When you were conceived in your mother's womb, the spirit came in from God. And one day when we die, your spirit will again leave your physical body and go back either to God in heaven or to hell. But then we also have a soul. And your soul is also eternal. When did your soul start? 
Your soul started at conception in the womb when your father's sperm and your mother's eggs came together and conception took place. And we get that from Genesis. If you read there, it says, and man became a living soul. So it starts when you were created. You were created in your mother's womb. But your soul is also eternal. But your soul, together with your body, is your fleshly part. Soul and body is flesh. Spirit is spirit. Your body is your fleshly home for your spirit and your soul. And it's also the temple of the Holy Spirit. We were just talking about that during lunchtime as well. Why is it so important for us as children of the Lord to, to watch what we put in our mouths, what we are eating, how we are looking after this fleshly body that God gave us? It's because it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. We have to look after our temples. But your body, your flesh, and we all, didn't Paul also say that? In our flesh, in our bodies, we we degenerate. We are busy, busy dying, actually, because we're getting older. But in our spirit, man, we get renewed day by day. Mm -hmm. So our bodies will return to dust. But both your spirit and soul will, has, has an eternal nature and will live forever. And if you are saved, it will go to God, to heaven. And if you're not saved, then not. But this is the important thing as well, that you know that both your spirit and your soul has a will and intellect and emotions. Yeah, Deborah, we've heard this before, but why is this relevant in the context of this teaching? Well, if your spirit has emotions, then your spiritual emotions, your spirit man's emotions can also get hurt. Isn't it logical? What is a good uh, example of the fact that your spirit man has emotions? Can, can anybody help me with that maybe? A good example. That your spirit man has also got emotions. Because we always say the, em the emotions are seated in our soul man's, in our soul dimension. Which is true. What about holy laughter? Holy laughter, have you, have you heard holy laughter yet in your life? When someone gets baptized with the Holy Spirit, sometimes there's holy laughter, not always. Or if, if there's a, a strong anointing of the Holy Spirit, people will start to laugh, but it's not like a demonic laughter, it's a holy laughter. It comes from your spirit. It's spiritual. Many, we've, many of us, we've actually spoken about it the other night, uh, when we pray and we go into deep prayer where we feel we really connect with the Lord, you, you know, you're intimate with the Lord, you start crying. But it's different. It's not as if a soulish crying like, you know, mm, you, are, you cry with your soul. You can feel you're crying with your soul. It is a holy crying because you will sit praying. Your, your face will stay intact, but the tears are flowing. Where do those tears come from? It it often happens to me, often. When I, when I pray, when I really connect with the Lord and I'm in deep prayer and in intimacy with the Lord, I start to cry. That's me. I don't know. It's always been like that. My, my spirit, I think it's the sensitivity of your spirit, man. And it's, I think it's that intimacy with the Lord that's actually too much for us to, to handle. Your, your, your spirit um, cannot handle being so close, well, in a good way. So... Holy tears, holy laughter. So, so if we can experience emotions in our human spirit, then it is just logical that our spirits, in our spiritual emotions can also get hurt. That is why it's important to realize that. Now again, the interconnectedness of spirit, soul, and body. How is it better illustrated by the fact that we all know, and if you don't know it by now, there's something called astral traveling which is demonic, which is under the control of Satan, which no child of God should be involved with or doing. You shouldn't have outer body experiences. If you have that, it means your kundalini is awakened. <laughs> Ecclesiastes six, uh, 12, verse 6 and 7, where we read that there's a silver cord, where the silver cord is broken. We can go and read that word. 
there's a silver cord. It's a spiritual cord. It's not like a rope or a thread that we can see. It's a spiritual cord that connects our spirits with our souls and our bodies. So that's why we say we are interconnected. And that silver cord may only be broken the day that we die. That is when a person dies, when the cord is broken in the spirit between your spirit and your soul and your body, and then you die. Because the minute your fleshly body gets disconnected from your spirit, it dies. Because the life is in your spirit. It's Jesus. It's the spirit man has the life that gives it to the soul and the body. That's why when we die, that spiritual cord is broken and the physical body dies. Astral traveling is when people by demonic forces, it's when the kundalini in you is awakened and strong and by will. That's also how you can free test will. free will, whether it's from the Lord or whether it's from you. Because many people, there's one guy that we once knew that said to me, yeah, but he often, you know, goes out of his body and then he travels at night and he can go anywhere. His spirit can go and he, he feels it's something that the Lord has Jesus, God, has given him the ability to do. No. The minute your will is involved, it's, it's not from the Lord. There are instances in the Bible as well where, for example, in Revelation, John was taken out in the spirit to see things that God wants, wanted to show him. Jesus wanted to show him. But that was not at the will of John. So it can happen that your spirit... That, the, that God takes you, Jesus takes you out in the spirit and shows you things. Many people have testified already that they've been taken out in the spirit to see what hell looks like, what heaven looks like. There's testimonies like that. It's possible and it can be from the, from the Lord Jesus Christ. But we must be very careful. The minute your own will is involved, people going lie on their bed, say, I'm going to go out of my body now and travel in the spirit. It's by demonic forces. And we are not allowed as children of God to do that. But the mere fact that your spirit can leave your body as that picture illustrates, that illustrates astral traveling. That mere fact shows you the interconnectedness. So the spirit leaves the body, but it's still connected with the body with a silver cord. And that also explains to us if there's then a shattered part, that part can leave the body and can be somewhere in the spiritual realm by demonic force. Jesus Christ will never want that for you, that there must be a part of you somewhere in the spiritual realm. But that part is also still connected by a silver cord with you, with your soul and body, which means that part has an effect on you. That's why many people that were the subjects of satanic ritual abuse still feel that they cannot break free of some of the emotions and the trauma that they experienced, even though they have already undergone um, inner healing to some extent. Now, the human spirit is where the seat of God is in us. The throne of God in reborn children of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our spirits have got the ability to be reborn. And once you are reborn in Jesus Christ, it means that Jesus' throne is in the core of your human spirit and Jesus reigns there. And it's also like the Lord, it, it's an analogy. Because remember, the Lord also speaks to us through his word, in analogies and in um, parables to make it easier for us to understand. It is like a spiritual seed that once you get reborn, the seed germinates. And it, from there, the tree in life, Jesus in us, because we have got Jesus in us. How, what does it look like in the spirit? It's like a tree of life germinating from spirit, from your spirit man, from that seed of God in us. That is then... When you get reborn, it's as if that seed that was there gets watered and then germinates into the tree of life, which is Jesus Christ in us. So our core human spirits are holy since Jesus lives there. And that is important to distinguish. We once had a, a debate with someone in the body of Christ, which is someone who teaches in the body of Christ and who's not in agreement with the spirit level ministry. And that person said to us, no, but. He cannot understand this because Jesus is in our spirits. How can our spirits be defiled? But it's because we don't understand the fact that our spirits are broken. 
So the core in, in DID terminology, that means your, DID, your ID book personality of your human spirit, your true you. The real you on spirit level, that core is in Jesus Christ and is holy. So it's also not correct to say, but our spirits can still sin. No, no, your reborn core, human spirit, cannot sin because that core is indeed holy. It is indeed where Jesus lives, where his throne is. But what about all the shattered parts? And what about what's happening around that human spirit, on human spirit level, not necessarily inside, but around? So, our core human spirits, spirits are holy. That we must remember. We cannot say to each other today here yeah, that, you know what, then this means in our core we are not holy and we can still sin. And it's not true what we said to each other in the beginning that when we get reborn in Jesus Christ, we are, no, we are now holy and um, our spirits are unblemished and we cannot sin in our spirits anymore. We cannot say that that foundational truth is no longer true. It's still true. But it's true in respect of your core, where Jesus lives, where, where, where the throne of God is, seat, is seated. But it's not true, unfortunately, for all the shattered parts. The human soul and body are sanctified, are sanctified through water baptism of believers. Because Jesus loves us, not only our spirits, because he created us, spirit, soul and body, he loves us, as triune human beings. He wants your soul also to be saved. Remember we said your soul is also eternal. He wants your soul also to be saved, but he knows we cannot do it by way of our own works, by becoming better people, by just living a good life. It's not, we can never earn our salvation. Not on spirit level, not on soul level. So Jesus made a way through the baptism of believers. That's why there's, there's scriptures in the word that sounds to us on face value a little bit contradictory. Because it says that, you know, when we get baptized, we, we, we will no longer sin or it, it breaks the curse of sin over us. And there the, 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 our sins have been nailed to the cross and it's over now and we won't. But then we discover after we've been baptized as believers that we still sin. So it doesn't make sense to us because we still sin. We will sin until the day that we die. We are fallen human beings. But what happens when you go under the water and you come up in your water baptism? You get clothed with Jesus Christ. It says there, in, I think it's in Galatians somewhere, we get clothed in Jesus. Because when we identify with him in his death and in his resurrection, if the Father looks at us, and if Jesus looks at you, what does he see? Himself in you. Completely. Spirit, soul, and body. And something physical is necessary to complete the rebirth in soul and body, because soul and body is flesh. Your spirit gets spiritually reborn. There's where the circumcision of the Holy Spirit happens in your spirit. But what about soul and body? So when you identify with Jesus in his in His death and resurrection by the full immersion in water, that circumcision is completed, soul and body. That's what the Lord revealed to us through his Holy Spirit. You can think about that uh, believer in Jesus Christ. Go pray over that and say, Lord, is this true? And you know what? The Lord showed us it's true because it makes so much sense. And if you take the scriptures about the baptism and go read again those scriptures and, and meditate upon the word, we may meditate, but only on the word on Jesus and who he is and on the word. If you, if you ask him to break it open for you so you can fully understand, you, you'll see it makes such a lot of sense because Jesus wants our souls also to be saved. And we cannot do it ourselves. So he must do it for us. And he says, just be obedient. Just identify yourself with me in baptism. So in water baptism, the resurrection power of God through the Holy Spirit is ignited in us, also in soul and body. And that explains to us why, and we've experienced it in the ministry room. That's why I say if people have criticism, I, my only question to you is have you tested it in the ministry room? Do you speak from experience or do you speak from knowledge? Because we have found so many times in the ministry room, if we try to minister to someone that's not been baptized as a believer, 
by full immersion, you're wasting your time. Nothing happens. Why are you wasting your time? The resurrection power of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit has not been ignited in that person in soul and body. It's only on spirit level. So that person is saved, yes. Only your faith in Jesus Christ saves you, period. Period. But what about the sanctification process that must now follow through in soul and body? It can only be ignited by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit needs to be ignited in the water baptism so that it can flow through to soul and body. The human spirit. The seed of God is in our human spirits, as we said, and it germinates into the tree of life, which is Jesus in us when we get reborn. And when you understand these teachings, if you go back to our teachings, the seed of Satan in the human race, and you, and you go study that again, you'll understand why Jesus said in the middle of the garden, where is our garden? In our spirit. In the middle of the garden, there's two trees. The one is the tree of life and the one is the tree of good and evil, knowledge of good and evil. If you choose to eat by disobedience to God from the, from the wrong tree, you will inherit death. If you choose to eat from the tree of life, you will in inherit eternal life. So um, it, just, it just makes so much more sense when we understand these spiritual concepts. This tree of life, Jesus in us, may be compared with a tree that starts small but grows into a powerful tree of life in us. Why do you think that Jesus tells the parable of the mustard seed? Or he, he compared the kingdom of God. It's not a parable. He said the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God in us. It starts small and it germinates into a powerful tree because the, the mustard tree's seed is very small. But it can, be, it can become a, a powerful and a very large tree. Matthew 13, verse 31, Luke 13, verse 19. The tree of life, the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a parable. It's not necessarily a tree. But what does a tree bring? A tree brings shade. A tree brings life. A, chi, a tree bears fruit. A tree has green leaves on it, some edible. You've got fruit. The, the birds can make nests in its branches. So what does a tree do? do it brings in nature brings life brings shade it can feed animals people can rest in its shade so the Jesus in us is compared to a tree of life and it's actually the power of the Holy Spirit in us that germinates from that seed in our human spirits that 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 gets germina that germinates when we accept the water the water is the Holy Spirit and the word of God and when we read the truth in the word of God of who Jesus is and that he died for us on the cross and that truth gets watered by the Holy Spirit in us, then you can get rid and you accept him as your savior. Then that seed can, can start to germinate and develop into the tree of life. So the tree of life is ignited and empowered also on soul and body level when we get baptized in water and spirit as believers because we get baptized first in water as believers by full immersion. Thereafter, you can get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's actually Jesus' will for us where we receive power to be his disciples. And then the complete tree of life in us is ignited so that we can operate as his disciples. The most sensitive part of our human spirit, of our human being, sorry, is our human spirits. So it's just logical. At the point of impact, let's say, for example, you get hurt, you get traumatized, shocked, rejected. What is the first point of impact then? The spirit. The second and the third points of impact are on soul and body level, and that is it, it's actually so logical, bride of Jesus Christ, believers in Jesus Christ. If we think about it, many infirmities are the result of hurt, shock, trauma. And it's a fact. You can speak to many, even doctors that would say to you, certain illnesses are mostly or often triggered by a trauma incident. And then suddenly you've got this autoimmune disease or you've got the body attacking itself by this or that. And, but it's triggered by a trauma incident. So when you get hurt, your spirit man gets hurt, it 
it flows through to the soul dimension. The soul dimension also gets hurt, but it flows through into the body. The body bears the consequences of that inner healing that has not come. So the hurt that is still captured on human spirit and soul level. Everything first, and this is an important thing that you must remember. It's a principle. Everything first happens in the spirit. And then it is felt in the natural, in the soul and body. And that is the same for in a wider context as well. Like, for example, if someone is called into ministry or first something will happen in the spirit. There is a declaration that goes out or a, or a um, trumpet is blown or the timing is in the spirit and it's happening. It breaks through in the spirit and then in the natural realm it will happen. But it is birthed in the spirit first then it comes into the natural realm. And it's the same for us because everything is in us also. It happens on spirit level first, then soul and body. To deal with inner healing merely on soul and body level is to remove a thorn by breaking it off at skin level. That's the analogy that the Lord Jesus Christ gave me. And if Jesus could give us parables or analogies when he lived on earth, can't he through his Holy Spirit's give us today also analogies <laughs> for things that we maybe, maybe it's difficult for us to understand. So we need a picture or we need a, a story or we need to identify it in the natural world with something. Many of you, I'm sure, yeah, on the farm it happens to us often, you've got a splinter or a thorn somewhere in your flesh. And sometimes if you're in a hurry, you'll just try and get it out quickly. But then you feel, ah, it's still there. And then you actually have to go and sit and take time, switch on a proper light, take a needle and take it out carefully and take it out deep, deep under the skin. If you don't take it out under the skin, it will remain there and it will, it will always, it will maybe be better for, for a day or two, but you will still feel that hurt under the skin. And if you leave it, if you leave it long enough, it will start to, it will fester. It will become worse and, 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 and it will actually become worse. And that's actually what happens now in the end time as well. The enemy has a plan. He has a plan. He's got an end time plan and he wants to work in the end time with trauma. We call it trauma guides in people that are still open. And if that thorn is not removed under the flesh and, and times get difficult, and, and, and we are under pressure, that unhealed trauma will make people not be able to withstand the shakening. We'll come to the shakening at the end of this teaching. Everything will be shaken. That's what the Lord says in his word. And that which is not built on the Lord Jesus Christ will crumble. And if there's still unhealed hurt on spirit level, it makes you vulnerable. And that is what the enemy works with at the end time. He works with DID, and with unhealed inner, inner hurt inner children and hurt inner adults that are still there, not being dealt with. And the minute the going gets tough, that unhealed trauma makes people vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So the tip of the thorn should be removed spiritually by asking Jesus to heal us on human spirit level and only he can do it. If we don't acknowledge him in this process and know that only he can do it, it won't, it won't happen. Only he can do it from human spirit level. The human spirit. When the thorn is removed on human spirit level, the healing flows through to soul and body level, but not the other way around. So we cannot pray on body level and think that the soul and the spirit will also get healing. It works from spirit level downward. Why? Since the seed of God is on human spirit level and it gets watered by the word and the spirit of God and it then starts germinating at rebirth. So the, the goodness of the tree of life, its fruit, its leaves, its shade, its life-giving ability flows through from, from spirit to soul and body. I'm actually showing spirit, soul and body, but our spirits are not in our heads. <laughs> Actually, you know, I, I think that what the Lord showed us is that your spirit, soul and body is like a carbon copy of each other. It's not like here's your spirit, then somewhere here's your soul, and then here's your body. The spirit, soul and body is like a carbon copy of each other. So if you could see in the spirit and someone astral travels, you will see like a shape of a body, that astrals. That, that shows you. It's, 
But that's not necessary for us to know, it's just interesting. Inner healing merely on cell and body level leaves the human spirit feeling more and more desolate, confused and ultimately forsaken. Now I want you to be honest with me today, uh, bride of Jesus Christ, believers that are sitting here. Can any one of you say that you have never felt forsaken or desolate? Desolate just means utterly alone. Where is God? Where is he? Does he still remember me? Is he really who he says he is? Is the word really true? Is there really a God out there? Now that is what the enemy's plan is in the end time. If we don't get healing and the pressure loads up and loads up and loads up, people must be brought to a place. And you can, you can think back of the times if you guys were ill like us when, when, with these viruses and illnesses that broke out. We were also ill. We fell ill, but we recovered by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Didn't you feel sometimes in that struggle when you were ill, Jesus, where are you? Didn't you feel desolate? Didn't you feel a bit forsaken? Some people told me that the most, the worst emotion that they um, felt when they were so ill is they felt <coughs> forsaken, God forsaken. Now that, the enemy taps in into the unhealed hurt and the DIDs on human spirit level to bring us to a point where we say, oh, it doesn't work anymore. Oh, I don't know if God even exists. Because if he exists, why am I, why am I feeling like this? Why, where, why am I ill? Why, why did this happen? And it's because of, yeah. Because, and remember, when we start talking about the DID on human spirit level, the enemy works very, very uh, hard with DID. He works, that's, that's one of his players in this, in this demonic play field of him that he uses uh, at most, is the DID on human spirit level. And it also explains to us a lot of things, which we will come to later. The human spirit also needs healing and deliverance. In, deliverance. in, in Proverbs 15 verse 13 it says, But by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. Now if there was a religious spirit out there that wants to challenge this teaching by saying, This is not in the word of God. Okay. What, what, how do you explain then? Proverbs 15 verse 13 that says, but by sorrow of the heart, the heart is the human spirit. So the human spirit can also have sorrow. And then it says the spirit is broken. So I think these things have been hidden for us for so long. The enemy wanted to hide it because it was there, but we never saw it. Or we read it and we read over it and we never thought about it. We didn't. Think, what does this mean? Proverbs 17 verse 22, but a broken spirit, what is that other than DID? Brokenness, shattered parts. A broken spirit dries the bones. What does that say? The spirit has a, a, an impact on your body because bones are in the body. So brittle bones or people that have weak bone structure, Maybe it's got something to do with the brokenness of the human spirit because the brokenness first starts in the spirit and then it flows through to soul and body. And there Proverbs, what is it? Uh, 18 verse 16. Proverbs 16 verse 14. The spirit of a man will endure his sickness. So what does that mean? If your spirit is strong and healthy, your body can get ill and, and your spirit can endure it and you will, you will gain your health again. But a broken spirit, who can bear it? Because your spirit man is supposed to give life to soul and body. Because the seat of God is there. So the life of God flows through by the power of the Holy Spirit from spirit to soul and body. Because of your human spirit, your soul and body is sustained. And strengthened. So doesn't it make sense that the enemy wants to come against our human spirits as well to weaken our spirits because then he can bring our totality of mankind to a full if your spirit is weak. Now this is the scripture that Jay has also mentioned in the beginning. And I must say when we, <laughs> when this thing about spirit level ministry first reared its heads, we were, we were, you know, it was actually, it was awesome times those, but it was also Terrible times because it was so bewildering. But I always remember the song that we used to sing right at the beginning of the ministry. Uh, can you remember that song? Uh, we won't be overwhelmed. Yeah. We won't be overwhelmed. 
And I remember the Lord said, don't be overwhelmed, Deborah. You asked me for this. Now, don't be overwhelmed. But when the Lord gave us this scripture of 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23, we found peace. As Jay said, we could find peace. Because there Paul says, now may the God of peace himself. Who is that? Jesus, Jesus Christ. May the God of peace himself sanctify you. So you cannot sanctify yourself, do you agree? Only Jesus can do it. But now there's another word that Paul puts in there. He says, completely. So what does that mean? If we don't tap into what Jesus can do in us, instead of trying to do it ourselves, the inner healing cannot be complete. Do you see the deeper levels of knowledge if you meditate on the word? The other day we were talking to each other and we said, be careful, don't meditate. It's new age, don't meditate. We agree. The new ages meditate on the wrong things. But we may meditate on the word of God. If you read that scripture and you read it and you think, see Allah, pause and think about it. Don't just read it and continue. Sometimes we read in the word together and then I say, say to my husband, but let's just read slower. Read a text a verse, stop for 30 seconds, think over it, what does it really say, then to the next verse. Because sometimes we read, we read, we read, we read, we read, close our Bible, and then we don't even realize what we've read. If you read that carefully, there's much more in that scripture than what we on face value realize. The God of peace himself, Jesus, Jesus will sanctify you. But he will do it completely, which means that if we try and do it ourselves on soul and body level, we cannot do it completely. And then he says, and may your whole, which by implication says, your spirit can be broken. Your spirit, body and soul can be broken. Otherwise, he could have just said, and may your spirit, soul and body be preserved blameless. But he says, but may your whole. So he says, not only a part of your spirit must be blameless, the core. Jesus wants your spirit to become whole again and your whole spirit must become blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why must we be blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ? Come help me. Why must we be blameless? He wants to find us without spot and blemish. J wonderful. He wants to find us without, without spot and blemish. Why? Because we are his bride. bride. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of women in this room and many of you have been brides or you are going to be a bride or you, you, you can just identify with that. How will a bridegroom feel if he waits in anticipation for his bride and his bride comes to him and her dress, her wedding dress is full of spots? He will still love her because he loves her unconditionally. If you really love someone, you love her. Point. Period. No matter how she looks. But it would be just so awesome if she comes to him prepared and she's without spot and wrinkle. And the, the, the bride, on the other hand, that really loves her bridegroom, wants to be the most beautiful for him that she can be. And there sits someone in the audience that have most recently been a bride. And I can still remember how beautiful she looked. Ne? How awesome and how beautiful she looked. And she's still beautiful. But I'm just saying is she tried her best that day to be as beautiful as she can be for her bridegroom because she loves him. So anybody that really loves Jesus, we're not speaking here about religion. We're not speaking about the intellectual, intellectual knowledge of God. We're speaking about an intimate relationship and you love him. You love your bridegroom. You will really want to allow him to completely sanctify you, to, pre to be preserved blameless. That is coming. So every hurt in a child and hurt in an adult is also on human spirit level. The Lord, a couple of years ago already, um, taught us this concept of when you get hurt, there's a hurt in a child or a hurt in an adult. And we dealt with them before on soul and body level. And we found them there. And in people where the demonic things talk, it's actually awesome to call that little Hurt in a child out, and here comes out that. And, and, then we, and then you ask, how old are you? And then the fingers come. And then it's an adult lady sitting in front of you, and then that little child comes out and says, 
you see that. We, 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 we can really testify from experience. So we know the hurt in the adults and the hurt in the children are there. And, and we have to deal with them so that they can be deep in the healing. But Jesus showed us through the power of the Holy Spirit that that hurt in a child or hurt in an adult is also on human spirit level. And what better example than that of Jairus this morning when he testified about the little boy in him on human spirit level, six and a half years old, that was extremely traumatized the day he heard his father died. And how he was overcome by, by uh, sorrow and grief. The minute that hurt in a child came out on human spirit level, uh, we could just see there's extreme trauma still captured on human spirit level. And we haven't seen it once, twice or thrice. We've seen it many, many times that they are also there on human spirit level. <coughs> that is that piece of the thorn that's broken off. If you've dealt with it on skin level, it's good but it didn't go deep enough. You, start, you should start on human spirit level. And then the human spirit is also broken, DID parts or altars. And this is actually a very disturbing thing. Bride of Jesus Christ, to think that the enemy is so evil, and he is evil, to steal from us in our human spirits and to actually use a part of your human spirit which is supposed to minister life to you, to now start ministering death to you. Because that is essentially what happens with DID parts on human spirit level. If that DID part has, hasn't got Jesus in them, but has got demonic forces in them, then that part of your human spirit, that DID part or altar, cannot minister life. But instead, it ministers death and destruction or illness or whatever. And it's just such a, it's, 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 it actually disturbs one to think that the enemy can do that, but we find it, we find it in ministry sessions these days, time and time again. And then there's caging and spiritual wounds also to be found on human spirit level. Many people in the body of Christ are so desperate and they say, I feel caged. I just feel blocked in. I feel as if I can't, I feel like a, a, the living dead. I feel like I'm alive, but I'm dead. I feel like a zombie. And many times it's because there's caging due to witchcraft, due to covenants that were made in the ancestors, but the DID parts on human spirit level are actually caged as well. So we find caging there. And your human spirit, just as your flesh can get wounds, if you fall and you fall in the ground or on gravel or whatever, you get wounds on, in your flesh. If your spirit get, gets wounded, or uh, hurt, then there's also spiritual wounds. Um, something just came to mind when Deborah was talking about this caging. Now, regardless of one's religion, did what? Infested the whole world. I think the only place where it didn't um, manifest, although some people say it did, is not Antarctica. The point is, you can go and speak to psychologists, reverends, people that are in the corporate world doing industrial psychology and whatever. Regardless of the person's religion or the person's nationality, millions of people started suffering from what? Anxiety being caged in. Your freedom were taken, was, was taken away. You couldn't go out of your uh, 10 square, square meter flat. Or your, or your small holding, you were caged in, and it affected not only your spirit, uh, your, your soul and body, it also affected your spirit. Some people don't even realize it. A devastating thing. And then lastly, the strong men demons are also found on human spirit level. Hear what I'm saying? Not in your human spirit, in the core human spirit, on human spirit level. There's a difference. And they, those demons are binding your human spirit. That's why so many people, I've often asked the Lord, um, because I've witnessed in the last, what is it, 11 years, many people being baptized as believers and then baptized by the Holy Spirit. And then some people, it just seems to me as if they just never, they never rise up in Jesus. They've been reborn, baptized, spirit-filled, but it's as if they remain 
I don't know. They just they can't rise up in their authority. They can't identify who they are in Jesus. They cannot rise up in their authority. But when we started to learn about how the human spirit can be bound, it actually started to make a lot of sense to me. Why are so many people struggling still after being reborn, baptized, and baptized by the Holy Spirit? That's why I say many things will start to make sense to you, believers in Jesus Christ. It's actually if you have logic. My father also always said to me when I was a little girl and we were very like, you know, wanting to achieve in school and good marks and whatever. He said to me often, he said, you know what? You don't have to be clever. You just need common sense. So what we say, and Jay also say, says that often, he says, there's another gift of the Holy Spirit, but we say that in <laughs> your tongue in the cheek. A gift is common sense. Just use your common sense. A lot of things will start to make sense. Thank you for that, for that input um, from the audience. Someone just said that um, it can maybe be explained how the human spirit is bound. Like people that are reborn, baptized in water by full immersion in Jesus' death and resurrection and baptized by the Holy Spirit. And then still they will say, but I want to read the Bible, but I struggle. Or I read the Bible and I get no or very little revelation from it. For me, it's like dead words. Or I, I want to pray, but I can't. Somehow I feel I can't. Or I struggle to pray. It's examples of how our spirit man is bound by the enemy to make it difficult for us, actually to break our faith and to, to make us turn away from Jesus. As Jay said in the beginning, that there are people who were once reborn that turns away from Jesus and are no longer reborn. Yeah.